Hello, hello. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. Welcome to Sets of Place. <laughs> I always have to warn Joe that I get really excited and start talking really loud, so I'm going to try to not yell too much, but I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to have you guys here in the Columbia Center for the Arts, and for the people tuning in from home, thank you for doing that. I'm glad you can join us. Um, Sense of Place is 13 years old. We <laughs> I really hope this season we become your most favorite teenager ever. Um, so... Tonight, we are going to go way back in time. We're going to go hundreds of millions of years before dinosaurs. We are going to go past multiple mass extinctions. And we are going to meet an ancient creature that I think by the end of the night, you will agree, maybe deserves more attention than we've been giving it. And I'm very excited to hear from our guest tonight about that creature. Um, we're also going to have some rap songs. And we are going to have the best show and tell you've ever seen. And so I can tell you, whatever algorithm Eventbrite is using to try to classify this event, we are blowing it up tonight. So, <laughs> um, Before I introduce tonight's guest, I want to thank our sponsors. And that's something you hear a lot at nonprofit events because we really rely on our, our sponsors. But I will tell you that it is not hyperbole that 13 years of Sense of Place does not happen without a community of sponsors who year after year after year after year show up and support us and say yes when I come to them begging for money. And I want to tell you that we are so grateful for you because not only does it mean we get to have people like Ralph here tonight and we get to learn about the Pacific Lamprey, but it means over 13 years we've had more than 70 people come to the Sense of Place stage. Thousands of people have been able to hear what they have to share with us. And as far as I'm concerned, we need more of that in the world. And I love that we get to do it here and that you guys support us doing it. So join me in thanking our sponsors, please. Thank you, guys. I also want to recognize Mount Adams Institute. Sense of Place is a program at Mount Adams Institute because we share a value in figuring out how can we help people connect with our natural world. And there are a lot of ways to do it. We're going to do it in some way tonight. Mount Adams Institute has a number of other programs that help people of different ages and from different backgrounds connect with nature. And they are a local nonprofit doing that important work on a national level. So if you don't already know about them, I hope that you will take the time to go check them out after the show. Um, so the way tonight is going to work, we're going to hear from Ralph. After that, there will be some time for some Q&A. So if you have questions that come up as you're watching, tuck them in your pocket and get ready to ask them. And then afterwards, we will invite you on stage to um, see some of the amazing things that Ralph has brought along with him. Um, but first, I need to tell you a little story of why this lecture tonight is happening in the first place. And it was probably, gosh, now almost 13 years ago, probably 13 or 14 years ago, I was working on a TV show. Um, I was literally the least important person on the show, but I was on a show and it had to do with something about food or unique foods. And um, it didn't matter that I was not important because I still got to go do all the interesting things that the show was doing. And so we went on one shoot out to the coast and harvested gooey ducks, which is quite an experience if you've ever seen that. And then we came back to the gorge and we got to go onto the Klickitat River and see dip net fishermen um, harvesting salmon. And then the next thing I know, we are on the edge of the Willamette River. Um, I think it was probably in Oregon City. And a boat pulls up to it, you know, pulls up to the shore, and we're all standing there. And the person says, "Okay, this boat, you know, you're going to get in the boat. It's going to go up this river. It's going to go around that corner, and it's going to get to this waterfall. And then people are going to somehow go to the waterfall and pull these eel-like things off of rocks." and harvest them and bring them back for a meal. And I thought, I can't even picture what this looks like. I, I lived across the river from that waterfall my whole life, and I'd never heard anything like this. I had no idea 
what was going on and what was this about. Of course, because I was the least important person on the project, I did not get to go in the boat. So I had to sit on the shore for what seemed like a million hours while this amazing thing was happening just upriver. But then that night, I got to go to where the ceremony happened that included what had been harvested, and those were lamprey. And it was, I, there was so much new stuff to be taking in, I, I barely remember the details, but I do remember this. At some point, someone came over to me with a lamprey, it was no longer alive, and wanted me to see, or more importantly, I should say, to feel just how strong their suction is. And you're gonna learn more about the suction tonight. And so they took the lamprey, again, not alive, and they stuck it right onto my forearm. <laughs> and I can tell you, I'd, there was a lot going through my mind at that point. And then they let go and it stayed stuck, which was amazing to me that this creature, even in death, still had this amazing power. They removed it. I don't remember it hurting. It, <laughs> it may have. I don't even know. I was so flabbergasted by what was going on. And when they removed it, there was a circle of just tiny little red pinprick dots from, but I imagine it, it was his teeth. Ralph could tell me more. And that was the moment that I was hooked. Um, I just, Lamprey was in my head, and it's been with me now for more than a decade. And so the chance to, to hear from Ralph tonight and to learn along with all of you is really exciting for me. So with that, I want to tell you a little bit about who we have here tonight. Ralph Lampman, um, that is his last name. <laughs> um, so flash forward, when, when, I, when we talked about having a lamprey lecture, I started asking around, okay, who can come talk to us about this amazing creature? Okay, and, and I'm married to a river scientist, so I know, I know a lot of people who are in this kind of work. And everyone said, Ralph. Okay, well, who do you think I should have come talk about lamprey? Oh, you need to have Ralph. Okay, well, well do, you, do you know anyone who talks about lamprey? Oh, you've got to have Ralph. Everybody told me Ralph Lampman. So I call up Ralph, and he's game, which is awesome. And he proceeds to not only send me the best bio photo I think I've ever gotten, you guys may have seen it, his head in, superimposed inside a lamprey head. Um, <laughs> he also had some of the most heartfelt um, writing about why he cared so much about this creature. Um, and I think you're gonna learn a lot more about that tonight. Um, he also said, would I mind him rapping about lamprey during the lecture? To which I said, doi, yes! <laughs> um, so among all those other pieces, <laughs> Ralph Lampman is a uh, lamprey research biologist for the Yakima Nation Fisheries Pacific Lamprey Project. He's been doing that work for over a decade. Um, and I think what you will see tonight is that it is much more than just a day job for Ralph. And I hope that we all leave tonight uh, singing the praises and sharing words about lamprey with our larger community because they're really special. So please help me welcome Ralph Lampren. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, yeah, it's great to see you all here. And I want to start with a, a, a short rap song. That's what I do. <laughs> My name is Ralph Lampman, and I like to say I really like salmon, but I love lamprey. You can find me looking for them in any given day, stream, river, lake, or an ocean bay. Some people eat them raw, but I cook them on my spit. I love them so much that I go into a fit. Even though some biologists don't like to admit when it comes to anatomy, this fish is legit. Um, so I want to start off with a film. It's called The Lost Fish. Uh, it's just a short uh, segment of the film, but I think it's a great way to um, start talking about lamprey, so we'll, we'll start with that film here. Oh.
they gave themselves up so that we could live on this world. The decline in these animals over the past 20 years is astronomical. They've been here for hundreds of millions of years but it's only gonna take a hundred years to wipe them out. In one short lifetime, in the whole, since the earth has begun, and since these animals became available to us and became our brothers that took care of us, and in one short lifetime, they've almost disappeared. And there are times that, that I worry that uh, I would sure hate to see the extinction of a species in my lifetime. People better realize what they're doing because we are a big family. We are the circle. That's what life is about. We take care of one another. So when we have someone in trouble, that's where the rest of us have to step in. We put them in the water. The rest is up to them. They amaze me. They are amazing creatures. They just stop. Uh, my brother Gil's cool. He just black cool. So yeah, that video is available on Vimeo, so um, it's free, so check it out when you have a chance. It's about 30 minutes and goes into the history of, um, of the, the struggle of lamprey. Uh, so today, as you know, we're going to talk about uh, lamprey. I, I'm sure you came here to also see the live lamprey, so here we go. <laughs> That's a, that's a rubber lamprey, not a live one. Um, it was made by Elmer Crow and one of the last ones he made, so uh, I'll need to get that one back. But um, we, um, I'm going to be uh, sharing a little bit about... Oops. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. It's a beauty, and it's about the same weight as a real lamprey. And, uh, so my last name is Lampman. It's just a coincidence that it sounds like a, a lamp, lamprey, but um, so I thought about changing my last name to Lamprey Man. But <laughs> one of the one of my issues, my wife said it, it's going to mean a divorce, so <laughs> that's the only thing stopping me. And I want to sh um, share the um, the wonderful collaborators I have out on the tribe, uh, Krifik tribe. Uh, we have. Um, you know, even though even among tribes, sometimes there's disagreements and fights, but when it comes to lamprey, we all come together and, and it's a wonderful thing. And as Elmer said, you know, no eels, no deals. Um, the tribes really mean it. So, uh, so outline uh, for today, oh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about, just start with the perspective and then I will go into a little bit about the biology and status, and a little bit about restoration efforts, and finish with the perspectives. So pretty simple. So lamprey, like when I, whenever I see them, I, I get this, um, you know, they have this startled look, um, almost like, a, it kind of reminds me of my seven-year-old son when I catch him red-handed, he's always got, <laughs> 
you know, they, they're pretty timid and they just look always surprised. So a lot of people think that they're scary, appalling, uh, fearsome, gnarly, but they're actually um, timid, quiet, peaceful, and, and really fascinating. And so a little story about my oldest son, Mike Pacific Lampman. You probably know why I named the middle name that way. Um, I was in grad school, and, and I had this uh, baby. Uh, as you know, grad school is probably the worst time to have a baby. It was a little unexpected. Um, and I was actually starting to take these lamprey liver oil pill to just get a little boost of energy. But it actually did a little more than just a little boost of energy. <laughs> So, we'll, so I'm blessed to have him, and, and I noticed that there's a lot of similarities between babies and lamprey. You know, one is they're both nocturnal, they're great at sucking, and they're parasitic to their host, and impossible to read their mind. It's, um, they're just uh, um, hard, to, hard to grasp, and they've got so many secrets behind them. So, you know, lamprey, when you look, look at them underwater, they, they may look like a Star Wars characters, um, but I, I really think they look like little babies. So. Yeah. <laughs> so they're special fish. They're different from a lot of other fish. They, they don't have any bones. They have cartilage similar to sharks. Um, they don't have any jaws, so they just have a suction mouth with teeth. Um, they only have a couple a dorsal fin and a caudal fin, no paired fin, um, no scales, so they're pretty slimy. Um, and they're, the unique thing is that they, they, they've been around for a long time, so they're, um, you know, we think about like sturgeon being a really old fish, and, and they've been around when the, when the dinosaurs were around, and we romanticize about dinosaurs, but we actually got a fish here just in our backyard stream that, that's been around longer than you know, any of these um, dinosaurs or ancient species. And, and compared to that, you know, humans are really, really young. So if, if you think of lamprey as a 100-year-old grandpa and grandma, basically, um, basically humans are, are a two-week-old baby. We're, we're still in our diapers. Um, this is going to be my last baby uh, analogy. Um, you know, we, we think we've seen a lot as huma humanity, but we really haven't seen much compared to lamprey. And so there's a lots of uh, way that we call lamprey, the tribal names. Um, you know, assume is one of the main ones for the Yakima tribe. I, I'm not going to try to pronounce any of the other ones because I'm going to do injustice. Um, but there's lots of different uh, names ba based on the tribes. And, and also, you know, the genus name Lampetra um, means stone liquor. Um, another genus name Ichthyomyzon means fish to suck, so that's probably appropriate. Or some people call them, a lot of tribal members call them eels or lamprey eels. Um, they, they're blood suckers, parasite, hitchhiker, lamprey. Seven-eyed cat, I, I haven't heard that one, but I, on Google it says that's what, <laughs> what they call them. Um, in Japan, they're called the eight-eyed eel um, because the seven gills in one eye kind of looks like um, eight eyes. In Ger Germany, they're called nine-eyed, and it's kind of a mystery why they call it nine-eyed. It might be the nostril or their, um, maybe the other eye that they're counting. Um, and chat de lons for in France, so many different names, but or you could just call them Brother Lamprey, like Elmer Crow does. A uh, little bit about the location. So, in the Columbia River, uh, Yakima Nation, highlighted in red, um, is um, is where who I work for, and you know the ceded land covers about one third of Oregon, Washington State, so. It's a pretty big area, and combined together with the other Kritvik member tribes, we occupy a pretty large portion of the Columbia Basin. And Lamprey has been you know, um, around a long time, so they've seen a lot of things that have happened, you know, ice ages, um, climate change, ocean changes, meteorites, volcanic eruptions, you know, the things 
that wiped out dinosaurs. Um, they've experienced all that, and maybe even alien invasions. Um, I don't never say never with lamprey, especially with lamprey. Um, so they've seen, you know, God only knows what, what they've seen on Earth. And, but just in the 150 years of recent human history development, uh, they have, uh, you know, basically put off, almost off to the edge uh, to the point that they were seriously threatened. And another kind of uh, cool photo here, here's a young of the year larvae uh, staring into Franklin Roosevelt, and you know he he has served four terms as a president, which is unheard of. You know, not even uh, Donald Trump has done that. Um, <laughs> but when, when you look at lamprey, they have served 450 million years. You know, which is I have to emphasize, or you know, that's a long, long time that they've been serving here on Earth. But we uh, rarely recognize, you know, the the service they have done. So there, um, you know, you can see the, the evolution in lamprey. Um, they, they look really similar to some of these invertebrates, like lancelet, uh, tourniquets, um, larval la as a larval lamprey. And, and then they um, somehow, some way, they uh, evolved so that to turn into adult lamprey, which has eyes and teeth and uh, acts more like a vertebrate species at that point. Um, we, um, so, you know, how that happened, we don't know. Likely in the Cambrian um, explosion period, you know, lots of things were evolving. And, and if we didn't have lamprey, you know, maybe we may not be here because um, it was really the start of all this evolution that brought us to vertebrate species and eventually us. Um, so some of the things that you can see in the evolution is like the seven gills that lamprey have versus the five gills that most sharks have. Um, you know, it initially probably started out like a lamprey and then it, the two of the front uh, gills um, slowly over time evolve into the jaw system. And, and that's why the so sharks have five versus lamprey are still left with the seven. And there's other, you know, medical um, breakthroughs that has occurred as a result of lamprey. So, like anticoagulants to prevent blood clots. You know, lamprey do that when they're feeding. So, we have um, uh, used some of that that um, that technology and spinal cord regeneration. They're they're the only vertebrate species that can uh, regenerate a spinal cord, so they can completely break it and um, recover. So that, that is really helping uh, with the human um, recovery as well. Liver diseases, uh, high iron loading diseases, diabetes research more recently, um, and also just as a new model organism that's been around for a long, long time. Um, and also just in other you know, scientific research, the amount of lamprey research has really skyrocketed and and even I, I can't keep up with all the, all the great studies that are occurring. So if you're not convinced that, you know, lampers are, are worth, uh, you know, uh, important species to be here, there's other reasons. Um, you know, there's a tribal culture and food source. Uh, they're also important for other, uh, numerous other species. They, they're, um, as a larvae and adult and juvenile, they're fed by many many different species, and, and they can also act as a buffer for salmon predation. Um, you know, a lot of predators, like sea lion, if they had a choice between lamprey and sea, uh, salmon, oftentimes they'll go for lamprey because they're slower swimming and, and they're really high uh, nutrition. So um, it's, it's one of, you know, if we had more lamprey, we can help the salmon avoid all that predation. And as a larvae, they do a lot of work underground, and um, they're recycling nutrients and, um, and uh, doing a lot of tilling and aerating that um, special habitat that other invertebrates and other species use. So this is a little uh, great example of um, an eagle trying to snap a, 
sea lion, uh, so you can, you can tell that they're important uh, food item, just seeing that. Historically, you know, there were a lot, lot more lamprey. This is at Willamette Falls in 1913, uh, so kind of like the Medusa hair look of lamprey. Um, that's got the biomass that used to be there. Um, that's no longer there. These are some older photos, like from the Dalles, 1887. People, I think they were taking a picture of tribal members fishing, but you can see the uh, lamprey, just uh, hundreds of lamprey on the rocks just being there. And this is from uh, upper Idaho, way, way past the Hell's Canyon, so way, way up. Up there um, in the early 1900s, there's, I'd say, thousands of adult lamprey that kind of showed up when they dewatered the dam. And I love the ladies kind of posing with the, with the lamprey there. Um, and so there, a lot of this historical info, you know, not, a lot of it's not written down. So uh, for us, I think the best source is interviewing elders. So we've interviewed quite a few um, to try to learn more about, you know, this knowledge gap that we have in history about, you know, where they were spawning and where they used to be. And um, so that's a really important um, source of information. And, uh, you know, the tribes used to harvest them all over the ceded lands, like even in the Yakima River, there are many places where they harvested them, but the numbers have gone down, so they haven't been able to do that, and, and that's really jeopardizing the connections that, you know, youth have with elders, learning about these lamprey culture and, you know, ways to cook them, and, and also, you know, it's the, um, yeah, the, the connections between the, um, you know, other species that's also missing, and that could be, um, you know, that could threaten other species as well. Um, but, but the culture is not lost, and um, it is still strong and present, and, and we're doing our best to try to preserve the, the culture. But um, tribes are not the only ones that um, uh, love lamprey. They're all over the world. It's a delicacy. These are some of the um, dishes that are available, like in Europe and um, in Japan, where, which, where I come from. Um, there's many different ways to prepare them. I personally, I like the sashimi um, raw. That's the easiest and um, best if they're fresh. Um, but also the royal family, like in England, really love lamprey. So uh, King Henry I supposedly died from overeating lamprey. I think it's a myth, um, but I, I'm not a king. I, I don't have access to that many lamprey, so maybe, maybe it was different. And lamprey are really nutritious. Um, the left graph shows the different types of nutrition you can get from eating one lamprey, 400 grams. Um, and the line, blue line shows the daily um, recommended intake. Um, and you can see pretty much you can meet all your needs uh, just by eating one lamprey. So forget about vegetables, forget about <laughs> drinking milk. Uh, just, yeah, pretty simple. And the, the graph on the right shows like all the, the, some of the things like vitamin A, B12, omega-3, they're super high, astronomically high. So like vitamin A is really important for eye, eye functions. And so whenever I get um, eye strains watching computer, I, I take a pill and actually maybe I'll, I'll take one right now. I don't know. No. I think you can pass shit around. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 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 <laughs> and uh, so instead of one apple a day, you know, we can have one lamprey a day to keep the doctors away. Um, like s even salmon, uh, they're considered you know, known as really healthy fish, but they're even superior to salmon in terms of many of these minerals and vitamins and, um, and even calorie, even their smaller fish, they, they have about the same calorie as a full-size uh, salmon. Uh, 
the tradition in Japan uh, goes way back. Um, uh, even in the 1600s, uh, there's some writings in Jap Japanese that talk about how lamprey could be is used as a medicine for night blindness. Um, and uh, these are some of the you know, earliest photographs from Japan showing the, the eight-eyed diner um, and people eating lamprey and kind of the traditional way that they capture lamprey over there. And it's pretty interesting to see like these tra lamprey baskets are, they look really similar to the ones that the, are made by the local tribes uh, from Yurok, Yurok tribe in the Northern California. Um, they look almost identical, probably different, um, different materials, but similar, similar look. Um, so like I said, there's many different ways that you can eat lamprey in Japan. There's even drinks you can buy um, and the pills. Um, I get, like if you really need a lot of energy, um, yeah, these, these are the giant size that you can get. And, um, and then this has got a magnet so it sticks on it. Um, but recently, uh, just early this month, there was a consumption advisory that came out for lamprey. So um, this is the first time that it came out and it was mainly the mercury, combination of mercury and uh, PCBs levels that were a little too high. Um, so that, um, that's the first time we saw this warning, uh, which is unfortunate. Hopefully the rivers will clean up in the future so we don't have to worry. Um, now shifting gear to the lamprey in the Columbia Basin, we mainly have three species here in the Columbia River Basin. Um, Pacific lamprey, uh, or I should say in the seeded lands of Yakima Nation, um, there's some other species. But uh, we have Pacific lamprey, Western River lamprey, and Western Brook lamprey. Um, they're just shown as a similar size, but they're actually a lot different size as adults because um, some of these are resident and some of them only spend a short time in the ocean. Um, and the Western River lamprey, Western Brook lamprey are paired species, so they, they can actually spawn with each other even though they have a separate name. So it's kind of like the steelhead and the rainbow trout. Um, so they're evolutionary, they're related. Um, and here in Oregon, there's actually 10 species of lamprey. Um, a lot of them are endemic to Klamath Basin. Um, so there's, uh, you know, worldwide, there's only about 40 species. So about 25% of the world lamprey diversity is right here in Oregon. So it's a pretty special place. There are uh, three main life stages of lamprey that we commonly see. So there's the larvae, um, or amacete, macrothamia. Lamprey biologists like to sound intelligent, so we come up with these crazy names. But they're really just larva, juvenile, and adult. And they go through a complete metamorphosis. Um, so you can see their mouth changing from a filter feeding mouth to a um, parasitic mouth with teeth um, over time. And when they first come in, uh, the tribes call them night eel. Um, but then they, uh, oh, sorry, and then they um, overwinter for a whole year and then they shrink in that time period by 20 to 30 percent. They, they don't uh, feed at all once they come back to the river, so they shrink and, and they kind of change colors and then they're called day eel um, at that time. Uh, they they kind of go blind by that time and so then they, they're not um, as careful and they come out even during the day. Uh, life cycle um, is pretty long, so compared to like coho here, which has a three-year life history, lamprey um, live a long time as a larvae and also as an adult. We used to think that they only spent two to three years in the ocean, but now based on genetics analysis, we're learning that they spend usually five to six years in the ocean. Uh, so they're mostly 13, 14 year olds. Um, some of them were 20 years old. Um, so so um, yeah, this is, uh, I had to update this slide because of the new information. 
and distribution um, within the Columbia Basin, it, um, they used to uh, go all the way to the upper Columbia and upper Snake River. Um, but, you know, as we know, there's um, uh, dams that prevent anonymous fish passage like salmon and lamprey. So they're um, limited just to the lower portion of the river. So they essentially lost 50% of their historical distribution. And at the uppermost dams, usually there's only about 100 um, adults or so that are counted each year. So they're functionally extinct um, in these upper regions. And this was an um, assessment that was done in 2011 and 15, um, kind of showing the health level of the fish. So the red color indicates um, ones that have gone extinct or um, seriously threatened. The, blue, the green indicates uh, relatively healthier populations. And you can see the interior Columbia is really suffering, and as well as this you know, California, the southern extent of their population is really suffering as well. And at uh, Bonneville Dam, the lowermost dam on Columbia River, these are the historical counts. And, you know, there's certainly a lot of ups and downs. And then there's a period where they just stopped counting. I think they had that one high year and like, this is too much work. We're not going to count these fish. So they just stopped it for 30 years or so. And, but numbers have actually started to come up, especially when you add the, um, these lamprey passage structure counts um, and you know, nighttime counts. Um, it actually starts to look better. I call it the Lampman effect because that's the year that I started working on lamprey. <laughs> um, but uh, unfortunately, it came down afterwards. So um, yeah, I wasn't that powerful. But um, these are, like I said, just daytime counts. So when you include the daytime, nighttime counts, they're likely um, twice or three times more, or maybe even more than that. Uh, so we can estimate maybe a million or so lamper passing Bonneville Dam, um, and probably about the same number going to Willamette River. Um, so probably easily two million lamprey were historically coming through Columbia River Basin. Uh, so we'll start kind of looking at a life of lamprey um, out in the world. So starting in the ocean, they can be found on the tail of uh, um, mink whales. Um, and uh, this is all the way up in Alaska, like Aleutian Islands. And uh, so uh, they, they travel far distances and come back similar to salmon. Um, and the host fishes that they rely on, there are quite a few. These are just the ones that we know. Um, you know, they do feed on somewhat on salmon, but uh, they target mostly the, the bottom dwelling fish like the Pacific hake and cod and, um, and even whales and sharks. Um, so, you know, they may be, you know, they may have a role um, to help keep the top predators in, in check in, in some way, but, but they, they don't always kill the fish um, when they, when they um, you know, feed on the blood. It, they don't always um, necessarily die from, from those events. So this is now back in the freshwater and they're uh, spawning. So, oh, sorry. Um, there's a video and I don't know if there's a way to click on the video, on the, on the uh, previous slide. If you maybe scroll around, there should be a play button. Oh yeah, there you go. So that's a male lamprey on a female lamprey head, kind of doing an intimate dance. And it's, uh, sorry, it's R-rated, so kids cover your eyes. Um, and they, so they do, you know, salmon uh, spawning is pretty boring. They're just laying next to each other, but lamprey do this really intricate dance and it's pretty fun to watch. Um, um, and, and, you know, the salmon carcass is really important to the streams. That's something that we've learned uh, that we need, you know, that's nutrient source. And, 
I think uh, maybe 10 years ago, I went to a conference and they were talking about how these different species of salmon carcasses helps each other, like from the downstream ones help the upstream species that are coming down and so forth. And, uh, but I think they, they were missing something important. You know, lamprey also spawn and die, and, and they do it at a special period when in the spring summer, which, uh, you know, which um, is not the case for salmon. They, they mostly spawn in fall and winter. And, and by the time spring summer comes, most of their nutrient are gone um, from, from the salmon carcasses. So lamprey comes in and they provide that, you know, rush of nutrient. And that's exactly when the salmon elephants are uh, popping up, you know, they're hatching, the eggs are hatching and they're needing to get some food and, and the lamprey carcasses are there. Uh, and so after spawning occurs, the larvae are mostly in the sediment, uh, so you don't usually see them. We have like hundreds of thousands of lamprey in our hatchery, but when you open the tank, you just don't see anything. And our hatchery manager didn't believe me that we have lots of lamprey. Um, they're just hard to see. Um, uh, here's another video of, uh, yeah, there. Yeah, there. So larvae are pretty easy prey, so they know they're just going to get eaten right away. So they, as soon as you release them, they'll go right into the sediment and hide. And, and this is another video um, showing their filter feeding. So they're kind of pumping sediment out and trying to incorporate, you know, whatever nutrients in the water so they can help, like, feed on the algae and help clean the water. Kind of similar to freshwater mussels. Yeah. And the habitat that they occupy are usually um, these type of places, kind of the channel margin where there's slow water and there's, especially if you have like these detritus, like twigs and leaves and things, that's their food source. Um, so when you find lamprey, typically you also find other uh, species like dragonfly, larvae, burn mayfly, uh, juvenile crayfish. There's, there's lots of other species um, when you find lamprey. And in Japan, they're uh, considered farmers of the aquatic world. Um, so this is a cartoon showing kind of how, um, uh, you know, as nutrients come in in the headwaters and lamprey are, they're sort of like the bacteria in your gut. So you need to have healthy bacteria to digest the food that's coming through. Otherwise you have diarrhea. So without lamprey, uh, basically we have uh, diarrhea in our river system. <laughs> So they're ecological engineers, and, and they're also considered indicated species um, in that they, they utilize all these different habitat, um, you know, fast water, slow water, and everything in between as, at different life stages. And also, they need all the different types of sediment, like uh, boulders, um, you know, um, cobbles for uh, adults and juvenile. But the larvae, as you know, need the fine sediment, so they really need all the diversity of substrate and habitat to, to make their living. And, um, and these are some examples of the predators of lamprey, um, not um, you know, exclusive, uh, just a snapshot, but you know, they should be considered keystone species like lamprey, I mean uh, salmon, because um, lots of you know, salmon predators um, also love to eat, eat lamprey. So some um, action shots of um, lamprey getting eaten. That's the goal or the stomach content of a seagull on the right. And you can see that heron. Uh, actually, some herons die eating lamprey because it gets stuck in their throat. But um, there's an article on that. Um, and that uh, link cod, you can see the hickey mark on the link cod on the left, upper left. So it's probably feeding at first, but then it got eaten and it was found in the stomach. And those sculpins were found in our 
uh, tanks, and each one of them had a lamprey inside. Um, so they, you know, typically when we think of Keystone species, indicator species, we think of salmon, um, and you know, ecological engineer. Uh, we think about like beavers, but lamprey essentially does all those things. Um, but yeah, rarely they're recognized for the for the services they do. And and the types of threats that are out there, there's many. Um, you know, some of these are similar to salmon, uh, but maybe just two times or three times worse for lamprey. Um, yeah, there's lots of different threats, but I'll introduce just a, some of these, um, like adult passage in the fish ladders. Uh, this is typically what happens when you have a really fast water. Lamprey are not fast swimmers, so they struggle um, at those points, and, and especially when you have a 90 degree angle, it's really hard for them. Uh, this is another video, and this is from Winchester Dam. I was a grad school student and just happened to find this lamprey um, trying to pass the fish ladder there. Oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could skip it if it's not doing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sarah said, you know, they can suck on sleeping uh, or dead. Um, so it doesn't take much energy to suck on. So they just kind of rest and then they go, rest and go. They just kind of tweak their body, release, and then go up and tweak their body and go uh, Oh yeah, we can go to the next one. Uh, so, the, so, you know, using those um, special skill sets they have, we have built these wetted wall structures. It just has a little bit of water going over and they climb up. In California, they've uh, developed this four inch flexible tube to pass lamprey. So they, they can just go through those little tubes and uh, keep going up. Uh, but also simple things like rounding corners can really help their passage. And we're also um, using these pavement markers um, on some of the wetted walls and it helps create a slow water uh, refuge for some of the lamprey to rest and, and go. So there's different ways to help pass them. Um, you know, small, the juvenile passage is um, sort of a black box. We don't know a lot. You know, sometimes we, we see these kind of entrainment issues, um, but we have a study um, scheduled um, for the next few years to um, look at juvenile passage at um, many of the Hydro uh, Army Corps dams. And we, we have a couple Army Corps folks here, so uh, kudos to them for getting this study um, done. Um, well, it's not done yet, but we're in the middle. Um, so we plan to look at their passage all the way going down to Bonneville Dam in the next few years. And, and PNNL, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, developed a small enough tag that could go into Lamprey so we can finally study them. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is, you know, entrainment, especially in the Yakima Basin, is a big problem. Um, there's lots of irrigation canals, and they actually create great habitat for larval lamprey, lots of slow water and fine sediment, but then it gets dewatered, um, and lamprey are not quick enough to get out, so they struggle and get stranded. And um, like at this particular site, we estimated about 50,000 lamprey that died. Um, in the Yakima Basin, I think there was one time that we found 7,000 dead lamprey on the bank. Um, but in recent years, they, they've, uh, the irrigation district has worked with us to slow down that dewatering rate, and so we don't see these type of issues anymore. Um, and you know, a lot of the fish screens are made for salmon, so you can see there's a big size difference with the salmon and lamprey. 
Um, so a lot of these fish screens don't really work effectively for lamprey. Um, you know, lamprey can be, small lamprey can be the size of your pinky nail, so pretty small. So we do a lot of um, restoration work and research to, to deal with the issues. Um, just, I'll go through just a few examples. So adult translocation, we uh, basically pick up the fish at these lower um, Columbia hydroelectric dams um, where they struggle and we bring them up to these upper basins, um, uh, give, basically give them a ride and, um, and let them go uh, spawn in, in those, those uh, good spawning habitat. So it started with you know, a few, just I think 15 fish on the first year, but each year we have gradually um, increased the numbers and to the point that we're reaching about 1,000 to 1,500 each year. I think this year we had uh, 3,000, if I remember right. So yeah, we had a big jump this year. Um, and as a result of that, we're uh, initially, like in the Yakima Basin, we didn't have very many Pacific lamprey. These were the places that we found some, but very limited numbers. After translocation, um, those arrows show where we place the lamprey, and, and we're finding larvae, um, you know, surviving and living in all those um, highlighted areas. So pretty much all over the Yakima Basin. Um, you know, from less than 100 river kilometer to um, initially to now we have uh, over four, 450 um, river kilometers of lamprey um, occupying the habitat. And adult numbers have also started to come up. So the bar graph shows the uh, Yakima River Dam, Prosser Dam, and start of the translocation was 2000, around 12. And just after five, six years, we saw a big jump. So the uh, line graph is the McNary Dam, just downstream of um, Yakima River. And uh, you can see it kind of past the baseline of the McNary Dam. Um, uh, we're trying to, you know, it's certainly great to see the increase, but uh, we, we are aiming higher. We want to get, you know, 10,000 to 35,000 so we can have a harvestable population. And we use parentage-based tagging um, to track our, the offspring, um, so, so using genetics. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, helicopter parents tracking their kids. Uh, we can track everything they do. Um, and these days we, we don't have to have male, both male and the female parent. We can just have one and still identify that this is offspring. And, and John Hess from Kutfig is doing a lot of amazing things. So now, even without the adult genetics, if we have two offsprings, we can tell that these two offsprings are related. So we can look at wild fish and if the yeah, see if they come from different places, we know that, okay, this fish came from Snake River and so forth. Um, and also, you know, with that, we can tell, um, like in Lower Yakima, where the fish are coming from. So we're seeing that they come from a wide variety of places where we le release the, our translocation adults. Um, so it's good to see that all of them are pr producing and being viable. And we're also learning about the age structure. Um, we know roughly when they spawn, so then we can tell, okay, these fish are so-and-so years old. And, and the Yakima fish tend to be younger compared to like Snake River fish are usually like six, seven, sometimes nine years old. So much older when they head out. Um, and we also do some translo uh, artificial propagation work. So these are the eggs and the pro larvae with the yolk sac, and, um, and uh, we also uh, successfully produced the juvenile, the eyed juvenile. Uh, so we thought we were first in the world to do it, but actually we were the second. There was a graduate student in Japan that did it, and uh, um, so we, um, he beat us to it, but we're still proud of that achievement, and, and we also proved that they can feed on uh, host fish, uh, even in fresh water. Uh, and so, 
you know, females, each female has about 100,000 eggs. So, um, you know, hatchery production could be, um, you know, effective tool to supplement if, if the numbers get really low. I think translocation works pretty well, um, but there may be situations where we need the artificial propagation and, and it also helps supply, um, you know, study fish that's needed for acoustic telemetry and whatnot. So we started just last year releasing experimentally in a few locations in the Yakima Basin and those are the enclosures. Um, these are the different sizes that we release. So we're kind of trying different life stages to see what works best and which survives better. So perspectives, finer notes. Um, um, you know, we, we do get a bad rep from the Great Lakes. I don't, is anybody from the Great Lakes here? Um, oh yeah, awesome. Uh, so usually, <laughs> You know, they don't have a good uh, view of Lampreg, it, and it's, you know, um, the effort from the Great Lakes, they do an amazing outreach effort to let people know these are evil species and we need to wipe them out, um, that so much that it actually transpires to here and we have to deal with that. Um, and there's even a Netflix video you can watch. It, <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. Um, <laughs> But, there, you know, we can fight that back with, you know, good PR. Um, there's lots of social media and different tools out there. So the Lost Fish and we have a, a Facebook page called Pacific Lamprey. Uh, hope you can all follow us and join us. Um, yeah, there's ways to fight that. You can also, you know, if you're willing, you can wear a Halloween costume for Halloween. This coming. <laughs> season. You can make a uh, lamprey out of old bicycle tires and different things. You can run a marathon with the lamprey and you'll probably wonder what, what the hell you're doing. Um, or you can make lamprey songs and put it on MySpace. There's different ways to get the word out. Or you can go to a dentist with a lamprey as a security blanket and um, act like a nerd. Um, so lampreys, are they really ugly? You know, the, there's um, the teeth that we always kind of focus on, but if you actually look at human mouth, it's, <laughs> I'd say human mouth is a lot worse. I, I would hate to stare at that thing. Um, so I think it's all perspectives. We, we really need to look at the big picture, the whole picture, not just one anatomical part, which never really shows in the in the river, unless you have a clear glass like this, they're always sucking on rocks and other things. So we need to change our perspective. <laughs> and, you know, I think if we had to uh, describe the hum problem of humanity, I think this is the best picture. You can write, you know, pages and pages about the, the thing, the, the human, humanity and what went wrong, but I think this is a perfect picture. Um, so, you know, in the fishery worlds, a lot of people are focused on salmon, um, but, you know, there's all these other species that are out there uh, that live with salmon and, um, you know, depend on each other. And as Aldo Leopold said, you know, to keep every cog and whale is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. You know, we need lamprey. We need, you know, as much lamprey that could suck onto Aldo. And, you know, instead of the Endangered Species Act, uh, potentially maybe we need, you know, perhaps we need an Endangered Habitat Community Act. Um, you know, we need to focus more on singles, uh, more on the community of species rather than just a single species. Uh, so the last word in, um, Ignorance is the man who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? If the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. If the biota in the course of eons has built something we like but do not understand, um, then who but a fool would discard seemingly useless parts to keep every cog and wheel as the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. So I think that's well said. 
you know, human evolution, this is what we typically think of, but if we look back, we probably <laughs> look like a lamprey back in the days. And I don't know which way we're heading. Um, <laughs> maybe we're devolving. Um, we need to think about that, but perhaps we need to look back at our ancestor, our ancient ancestor, and try to learn from, um, you know, these lamprey, that they probably have some words of advice. Uh, you know, I think w there's many definitions for wisdom, but I, I believe it's the ability to sustain life from generation to generation, you know, for uh, millions of generations, if possible. Um, so in that sense, I think lamprey are sort of like the Jedi master. They're, they have all the knowledge that it's just a matter of us opening our heart to, to listen to them. So with that, I think, you know, I want to acknowledge all the partners that are um, now working to help restore Lamprey. Uh, we really need all of them to do their share. Uh, the tribes can't do it alone. And there's also a conservation agreement that's coming up. Um, the due date is December 1st, so any entity could sign on as a signatory. Uh, so I really encourage all of you, if you have organization, think about signing on. And um, yeah, I think, so I, I think we proved that uh, we can restore lamprey, like even in the Yakima Basin, which has so many threats, we're able to bring them back. So it's important first, first step, but there's uh, many, many more uh, steps that we need to complete. And maybe I'll, yeah. It's a video for this one. Yeah, you could click through. Yeah. Uh, this is my oldest son, Micah, eating his first lamprey. Um, we didn't sugarcoat it or anything. It's just a <laughs> smoked lamprey from a, and we buckled him so he, he can't escape. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see. Yeah. So they, they actually use like the dried lamprey for teething infants. It has oil, so it soothes. So they use it, um, you know, from cradle all the way to, to grave. Um, in funerals, they serve seven lamprey. So they're lots of important use throughout their, their entire life. And then, yeah, we could go. So yeah, that's everything I have. Um, and if there is time, I want to do um, another rap song um, to finish up. That's my conduct demo. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a video, sorry. This is the last video. Oh, this is the, okay. Yep, yep. Did everyone get their, um, what, what was in that pill that you gave us to take? <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to help with memory, oh, okay. but yeah. Yes. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this the arrival? Yep. yep. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> about putting us in a historic archival, forget about all this neglect and deprival, respect the lamprey, yo respect the lamprey. I'm a vampire blood sucker parasite, and many people want us simply out of sight, but we have the right to fight the plight, and hope down the road you'll see the light. We've been around for 450 million years, so stop the smear, and don't you miss here? We were up here long before the dinosaurs appeared. 
can say this without a tear You know I'm a sucker naturally But don't you dare judge me I have a function on this planet No, can't you try to understand it? We bring back the ocean's rich nutrients To serve our fellow constituents We need clean water Just like a son and daughter And who said you could slaughter All my sons and daughters Live on, live on, yo It's the arrival of the Lamper Revival Live on, live on, yo Forget about all this neglect and depravity Live on, live on, yeah We deserve our own survival Live on, live on, yo Forget about putting us in a store or pebble. As a juvenile, aka MSC I don't feed on any meat except for a special treat I filter feed on algae and detritus Now come over to my pad and maybe you can try this I help digest the stream debris so you can enjoy the clean water carefree Fish, birds, and mammals devour me But I'm still alive in their poo and pee, you see? It's a cycle of life, said Mohammed Gandhi It adds life energy to plants and trees But as an adult, I'm on the soul It's the blood and body fluids that give me a jolt Hopping and hopping from prey to prey Searching for my target night and day But killing isn't my goal anyway As long as I get a modest meal, life's good, I say Live on, live on, yeah, it's the arrival of the Lamper Revival. Live on, live on, yo, forget about all this neglect and deprival. Live on, live on, yeah, we deserve our own survival. Live on, live on, yo, forget about putting us in a stork or a kyle. Lamper need a little bit of rest from this pitiless in human disinterest. I hope you can digest this great manifest Cause this ain't no joke or a jaded jest Lamprey and no nuisance or unwanted pests Well maybe in the Great Lakes but not here in the West Now that the fish shocks in the oceans are severely depressed Humans are put to the test So let's all get dressed Roll up our sleeves And do our best to make this Lamprey revival a success Lamprey deserve life Not death Lamprey deserve life, yo, not death. I said Lamprey deserve life, not death. I don't want to second guess what happens next. So I won't accept any answers from all of you except for a big, big yes. You know what I'm talking about? You feel me, bro? Can I get a big yes now for Lamprey Revival? Can I get a big yes now for Lamper Survival? Yes! All right, it's good to hear, good to hear, thanks. Um, keep it real to the Lamper family. It starts right here, right now. You can make it, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That, yeah, Eventbrite has no idea what to make of this now. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ralph. Joe, do you mind just raising the house lights a little bit? Um, so this is your chance. If you guys have a question, raise your hand. Um, and I see someone right here. Will you just tell us your name and then you can ask your question? Alana. Alana. Um, do lampreys live in Hawaii? Do lampreys live in Hawaii? No, um, they're most, they're not in the tropical area, so they're in the northern hemisphere above, you know, those, um, the warm zones, and then there's some in Australia and New Zealand, but not right there. They're, yeah, that, that would be a cool place to research lamprey if they were there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alana. Any other questions? Oh, right here. Can they live in salt water? Yeah, adults go to the ocean, so they, they, yeah, they have to be able to live in the salt water during that time. All right, I saw one down here. There you go. Hi, I'm Caitlin. Thanks for coming. This was great. How are they doing 
in Japan and in Europe, if France and Portuguese and Spanish folk, all of them, right. how are they doing there? Yeah, um, the, um, all over the world, the anadromous lamprey that go to the ocean and feed are struggling. So there could certainly be, you know, ocean issues or host fish issue. Um, you know, there's less and less bigger fish in the ocean. And um, so, uh, yeah, and there's also, like in Japan, they, they harvest to this day, they harvest quite a bit, so there, there's over harvesting issue there as well, and some in Europe um, as well. <coughs> but but I think they're all seeing similar threats and issues. Oh. What do lampreys eat? Ah, uh, yeah. Where did, I, where did it come from? Oh, oh, right oh, oh there. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it depends on their life stage. So. Out in the ocean, they feed on the blood and body fluids of usually bigger fish. Uh, but once they um, come back, they stop feeding for like they go without food for a year. The filter feeding larvae um, are feeding on things that are breaking down, like um, you know leaves, twigs, or even salmon carcasses or algae. We don't really know like what exactly they're feeding on. You know whether it's the microbes or uh, fungus or, um, but yeah, that, that's, that keeps us going to try to learn more about them. We're down here now. Yep. What is the force of its suction? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I wish I could tell you exactly, um, yeah, what it could, but there was a Japanese folks that came to Willamette Fall, and unfortunately they couldn't get the right to f uh, film and do the things, so they, they got some lamprey and they put some water bottles attached to them, and I think they were able to have like three bottles of uh, water bottles, I think, you know, f 500 milliliter, so, uh, and these were pretty weak fish that are uh, on the cusp of dying, so. Um, yeah, they can easily carry their own weight, of course, but um, uh, yeah, that's uh, as much as I can answer. It's like, that was a serious, like, like take, move over Alex Honnold. Their free solo up the waterfall, uh -huh. that's, that was impressive. Yes. What would you say is the biggest threat to the rampant? lamprey in the Columbia River Basin? Yeah, um, there's uh, knowns and unknowns. You know, we do know passage is an issue for adults still, and, and for juveniles, where it may even be worse. We, we don't fully know. Um, but, but there's also things like contaminants and you know, um, the larval lamprey and the fine sediment where lots of contaminants tend to accumulate and they're in there for years and years. So uh, we don't know, we know they're kind of high in a lot of these contaminants, but we just don't know how it's impacting them. And there's also predators, you know, lots of invasive species and uh, even like carp and, um, you know, uh, yellow or, um, uh, uh, you know, catfish and these inv bass, these invasive species prey on them heavily. So I, I, I listed like four or five. So <laughs> sorry, it's hard to pick one. Ralph, hi, I'm David. Um, I'm curious, will removal of the lower Snake River dams improve their survival and ability? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think it would. Um, you know, th there's definitely, you know, issues, especially when you have a series of um, dams, it, it really impacts their um, their passage. So, you know, they can make one or two, but when they have to pass eight or nine, they, it's cumulative and, and it, it's tiring for them. So if, if everything was free flowing river, I, I'm sure there'll be lot, lots more op opportunities for Lamprey to, to go there and, and as per uh, of course, is really pushing um, to make to make that happen, and I, I think there's a lot of momentum right now for that. Did you have a question? Okay. 
Why do they have um, teeth? They're <laughs> sucking. Why do they need teeth? Yeah, I think they evolved. Um, well, I guess there's different theories. Some, some people think that they started off as adults and then evolve into these larvae like stage and so uh, they, they may may have had it to start with or may, they may have evolved to get that teeth um, we don't know um, but one one cool thing is they, they shed their teeth about every month or so so on our tanks we get lots and lots of teeth um, they look like these and and one of our staff makes um, these cool um, art pieces with the teeth. So, uh, so uh, yeah, we're, we're not like physically yanking them out of their <laughs> mouth. We just use the ones that are available. Hopefully that, did that answer the question? <laughs> um, a quick one. Where exactly are they phylogenetically and what do we know about why they've been so globally successful in that specific niche? Yeah. Um, so they're uh, the oldest, uh, you know, vertebrate species, kind of on the same level as hagfish in the ocean. Um, so they're the only species that are still alive today. A lot of the species that evolved and were present afterwards are, um, you know, no longer here. And and they, you know, they they were feeding the blood. So there had to be other animals when they were around. But all of those have went extinct um, over the eons of time. And, and I, I think it's just, they have a special niche, you know, as a larvae, like a food source that most other species are not using. Uh, you know, they don't grow very fast, but they can steadily grow and survive. Um, they're also really f adaptive and flexible and plastic. like. They don't all go out as six-year-olds. They don't, you know, stay in the ocean for four years. There's a wide variety of uh, kind of life history patterns. So I, I think that also a lot. Like when when one group dies out, the the other group survives. So they're really good at spreading the net and making sure one of the survival strategies work. And okay, a couple more questions. Yes. Um, what do areas in like the the Great Lakes? What do they dislike about lampreys? Yeah, um, so they were um, a canal was built that opened up the way from the ocean, Atlantic Ocean, to the Great Lakes, and and, and they were able to navigate through there to get to the Great Lakes. Uh, although there they were some native sea lamprey I, um, in some of the lakes. Uh, some of that's kind of debated, but uh, but either way, um, more came in, and and it really, um, you know, had all these fish to feed on that were not, you know, um, that that didn't evolve with the lamprey, so they had a hard hit. And but it, but in a sense, they they do make a scapegoat out of lamprey because there, there's also over harvesting and contaminants that were also affecting the you know the fish that people were harvesting and that kind of, you know, but there's lamprey that you can put all the blame. So they really put all the blame on lamprey and, and they spend, um, you know, I think like 20 million years, uh, 20 million dollars a year trying to control lamprey in the Great Lake. So it's a budget that we wish we had over here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Val, we're up here. Yeah. Um, Do lampreys show any homing fidelity to their natal streams? Yeah. Uh, hold on now. <laughs> I'm sorry. You need to say that a non-fish can draw lampreys. So, <laughs> so like, yeah, like salmon, do they go back, tend to go back to the stream they were born in? Yeah. Um, yeah, there is a, I think there's a spectrum on homing, you know, to ones that go almost to the mark where they spawn and come back to no homing at all. People tend to label lamprey as not homing at all, but I, I think there's somewhere in the middle where, you know, they think there's coarse homing, like the 
We're learning that the ones that come back to Columbia River, the ones from Snake River, tends to go up the Columbia River, not go to Willamette River. So I think they have some, some coarse sense of homing, but not to the like, exact same stream. And, and they also, they can smell the pheromone of larvae. So that's their cue that, OK, there's survival here, so it must be a good stream. So that's how they're pretty effective in occupying, you know, uh, well, um, not new habitat. I, I guess, you know, even if they're not from there, they can smell, you know, um, the, f the larvae and know that it's a good place to go. So they have different strategies. Okay, one more. And then, and then we're going to do show and tell, guys. Um, Ralph, I'm Pat. Uh, the uh, uh, eel population in the Yukon River, is that also Pacific lamprey? And is that population also collapsing? Yeah, they have um, Arctic lamprey there in Yukon River. Um, so that's the, the main species there. And, 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 and they also go to like Japan and Russia and other places. And, and the tribes harvest them there. Um, like in the wintertime, they come up in the wintertime, unlike Pacific lamprey. So they drill a little hole in the ice and and they catch them, at, like the lamprey suck onto the ice as they're coming up and catch them that way. There's some Pacific lamprey in the southern extent of Alaska, but it's mostly Arctic lamprey, and, and their, their numbers are going down as well. Okay, before I get the last question, because I'm the host, so um, I'm gonna ask you, and then I'm gonna make a couple announcements, and I'll come back to you for your answer, okay? So if you were to be able to wave a magic wand and, and change something specific, not just wave it and say, oh, now there's a kajillion more lamprey. What would you wave to have changed for the Pacific lamprey here in the, in the uh, Columbia River Basin, okay? So think on that. Why Ralph thinks, I want to thank our incredible team. We've got Joe Garut up in the AV booth. We have Jeff Greenwood doing live stream. Rod Parmeter doing live stream. Etta Souser is out in the front um, helping check you guys in along with our volunteers and she wanted to make sure that I let you all know if anyone's interested in volunteering, you get to have a seat to the show, you get a hangout, you get paid in a lot of wonderful knowledge. Um, there's a sign-up sheet out there and we love having volunteers because it helps make everything go round. Um, I also want to thank Kyle Ramey, who offered to come help us get some photos since um, we didn't have any for like three years. Um, I want to tell you a quick alumni update because I think it's really cool and I get excited talking about our alumni. Some of you may remember Dr. Jocelyn Akins from season 12. Yes. She's the founder of the Cascades Carnivore Project and she does research on wolverines and the Cascade Red Fox. And for many, many years, the Cascade Red Fox was relatively unknown. And she has been leading the charge in doing the research on them. They, are, they live only here, as far as we know, and nowhere else in the world. And it just recently was listed as an endangered species in Washington because of her research. So <laughs> kudos to Joss. Um, Next month, you guys, November 9th, we have Bone Blair, who some of you guys may recognize, and he's going to talk about Nancy Russell's legacy at Cape Horn, which is basically sort of using that story to look inside the campaign to create a national scenic area in the gorge, which um, was controversial, still is in many ways, mm. and is a great story. Um, so I hope you'll join mm. us for that. Let's see. I think that is all. Tell your friends. Help us do some marketing if you can. Um, and check out the archive. This live stream will go up um, within the month, I think, so you guys can share it with people who might want to see and listen to Ralph's stories and raps and everything else. So, Ralph, I want to hear your answer, and then we will have a chance to do show and tell and head out. So go for it, Ralph. Magic wand. Yeah, I want to have a kajillion lamprey. No, okay, you're not allowed to do oh, that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it will be, um, you know, if we can, if the tribes can have a uh, harvest locally, like, like say in the Yakima River, I think that would uh, be my wish because I, I promise that once that happens, I can retire. So, 
so I can retire and catch more lamp. For it. All right, you heard her here. You guys help me thank Ralph for t joining us during a very busy time. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you who want, you are welcome to come up and see. He has all sorts of things that he can show you and you can ask questions about. Um, and it's, that's it. That's it. <laughs> thank you guys.